my name is Lara Gomez, and uh, I am a, uh, a professor uh, and uh, teacher at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and I, I have a, um, I teach primarily at the School of Law, but I have close affiliations with the Chicana and Chicano Studies Department at UCLA. Mm -hmm. I'm a faculty member there. Um, uh, by courtesy and in the sociology department as well. I'm, I'm working on, in a way, what might be thought of as a sequel to my book, Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, which just came out in uh, second edition a few months ago. Um, and uh, I should just say, we thought that it was very important to do a second edition. It has a new preface and a postscript that really brings the the story that I tell up to the Trump era and you know with so much uh, of the daily assault on human rights and civil rights and the dehumanization of, of people in particular um, immigrants but not only immigrants um, it just seemed important to sort of retell the story with that context. Um, and the book that I'm working on right now is in many ways a, a kind of sequel. It's about the racialization of Latinos in the United States. Um, looking at the period of 1980 to 2020. And uh, so what's different about that, both books are about racialization or the process of how groups become uh, you know, how they come to learn their place in the racial hierarchy. Who, who are they at the bottom? Who's above them? Who's below them? That process of racialization, which is a, a structural process, right? Mm -hmm. um, it has implications for identity also, but it's a, it's a macro process. Um, that process, I focus on the, in the book on Mexican Americans in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. But this book really focuses on all Latinos in the United States and uh, racialization, which is a little bit tricky, right? Because there are ways in which Latinos are very different, right? And, and uh, I don't want to overstate that difference, but what the book is about in essence is how the dominant whites see Latinos as the same and even how a, not, a lot of non-Chicano Latinos are racialized as Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. And so, be, and because Mexicans are, are nearly 70% of all Latinos in the U.S., we, we Mexican Americans, are driving a lot of the policy conversation dynamics. I mean, I think, I think that the idea of intersections is a very compelling one, but it also is contested in in lots of different ways, right? So um, I think in, in my book on, on what I call the original Mexican-Americans, those 115,000 Mexicans who overnight after the war and after the treaty and the surrender became American citizens in a, in a kind of superficial way, but formally American citizens. Um, there's a way you could say, oh, look, we could talk about um, intersectionality and talk about Pueblo Indians and other Native American nations and uh, Mexicans at that time and we could think about it as well there you have many things in common right mm -hmm. um, for example um, the settlement pattern that both uh, when it was under Spanish control and under Mexican control the settlement pattern that the governments pursued in the region that we're in right now in central and northern New Mexico mm -hmm. was to encourage mestizos to come and settle next to Pueblo communities, right? So in many, many places in New Mexico, including several right around Albuquerque, you see the Pueblo, which has been there for a very, very long time, right? And then you see a much more recent 200 or 150 year old mestizo settlement near it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's mutual dependency and there's intermarriage and there's you know, all kinds of, 
of ways in which there's there's uh, commonalities, but there's also tremendous conflict. And what what my interest is, and I think this is implicit, I guess, in the title of your journal to to me, is um, what forms that conflict takes and how we so I, I want to unmask that because we so often don't want to see racial conflict. You know, we want to call it something else. Oh, that is cultural or oh, that is class. And those are all really important things and real things, right? But we deny the the racial conflict because it I think because it goes back to that original sin of the United States, which is slavery. Right? And so, you know, slavery becomes the the you know kind of paradigmatic form of racial oppression and we don't want to see what exists today even though we don't have formal slavery well i i will answer as somebody who's not in the field of education but who has tremendous respect for um, what is happening in terms of critical race perspectives in education both in terms of the the research but also the sort of applied critical race theory, right, that is going on in, in schools and in less formal educational settings as well. And I should say that one of my colleagues uh, at UCLA is Danny Solorzano. And so I've, over the years, I've interacted with various of his students who are working in this field also. And, and um, you know, I, I really appreciate that work, but I'm not, I'm, I'm talking from outside of of education per se, although of course I, I educate my own students, the law students, right? But that's a little different than I think what we're talking about here. But I guess I guess I think that that is a huge um, like we have. I I really think that it's important to think about how our where our work travels, you know. And I'm I'm not the kind of person who's out being an activist and going to be. But I'm really excited that my work is speaking to people who are, who are doing that, mm-hmm. including my, my law students, some of whom are doing amazing, very um, critical and uh, counter-hegemonic legal work, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. which is kind of an oxymoron, right? <laughs> but but it, it, so it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. And I think education is similar in that way, right? Mm-hmm. For, you know, I have several cousins, first cousins here in Albuquerque, who are um, uh, K through 12 teachers, right? Mm-hmm. And it's a struggle. I mean, to try to resist in that bureaucracy and in that hegemon that is kind of, you know, public education with the various sort of entrenched interest. Mm-hmm. So we live in a society where there is entrenched. Uh, anti-black racism and it is at every level of our society Um, even though there's some message countering that it's still here and so anyone who comes into the society whether they are new members of the society as immigrants or whether they are disenfranchised members of that society they're still learning the social you know, the social do's and don'ts, the social hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so there's that. But there's also, I think, a very particular experience. And, and, And I think this is true all over colonial or colonized Latin America, as well as including Mexico, of course. And so including you know, the, the, the Latinos who have come to the United States, which is very much a, a, um, a, a color, uh, hierarchy in which, uh, we were all taught that darker skin and African features were, were negative, right? And associated with fewer resources historically in the castas under Spanish colonialism. Um, so, so those tensions are very, uh, very real. You know, one thing that I think is interesting right now is a lot of people are doing, including some people in my own family, um, are doing the DNA Mm -hmm. results, right? So one thing that's happening is, uh, at least here in New Mexico, from my anecdotal information, people are dealing with, they're coming back and they're seeing North Africa as part of their heritage. 
right? Which, which really isn't surprising if you think, well, the Moors were in control of Spain for 800 years. Why would that surprise us, right? Or they're seeing um, other African countries, right? Um, because why? Well, there was tremendous slavery to all of Latin America, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, we, that, is, that is us, right? We have that, that ancestry um, and it's not always visible and, you know, but, it, but sometimes it is visible and we deny it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when there was, I remember seeing an interesting data point. It was early 20th century in Albuquerque. Um, there was a census and there was like maybe 14% mulatos in that census. And then 10 years later, it was down to like, you know, 1%. But it was the same families. Right. So they were learning. Right. They were learning. OK, it's better to be to not yeah. claim that. Right. To, to push that down. It's so interesting when you look at what people there are a lot of people who will mark the white because they're not really sure what to mark. And they're not necessarily rejecting, you know, blackness. But but they could be they could be, you know. Well, um, it's interesting mark, but... because Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans, they're they're choosing some other race mm -hmm. about half of the time oh, okay. on the census, right? Um, so, yeah. and then uh, for for Puerto Ricans, of course, a lot more of them are choosing black on the census. But but I think the broader story is why is why is it that Latino isn't a racial category? Mm -hmm. You know. And that actually is a really interesting story, too. And it's not, it's, you know, some things that I've learned recently, it's not just about what you might think it's about. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not so apparent. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's complexities in that. Absolutely. But none of that is to say that there's any, you know, the, the, the thing that I haven't mentioned in this, which we should, because the question is a really good one, and I'm very interested in it, as you can tell, um, there's no doubt that Latinos today are um, racist against uh, blacks. Um, and that includes, you know, racism against Afro-Latinos and sometimes Afro-Latinos racism against other blacks. Um, but at the same time, there is racism within the black category, oh, right? Or colorism yeah. or... Or, you know, language, uh, you know, the, the, I remember seeing the research that was showing, well, the, the immigrant African American or blacks were struggling to say, oh, we're not like them. We're, we're going to speak our language so that people will know that we're, we're different, you know. So, again, those dynamics are endemic in our society. So it would be surprising if we didn't see them. But I do think there's these particular historical antecedents for Latinos that make it very salient. You know, it's interesting because my book does appear on that curriculum, but how does the, how, I don't, I don't know enough about it to know, is the ethnic studies, is there the idea that, okay, if you're Mexican-American, if you're Hispanic, you're going to take ethnic studies about that, and if you're black, you're going to take this, or is it one program? It's one program they're trying to put it, um, it all the, yeah, all the because I think if it's that way, it absolutely has to take account of the anti-Indian, anti which is huge among Latinos. Although, you know, there's, again, there's interesting permutations about that coming now because more Latinos, I think, in New Mexico are recognizing their indigenous past. Not that it was, it, it was always known, but it was kind of like hush-hush, you know, and now it's more openly talked about. But that, there's tremendous racism and uh, theft of land and theft of resources. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one really interesting way to talk about that and study that would be look at the dynamics of residential segregation in Albuquerque, right? Look, where do, where do blacks predominantly live, African-Americans? You know, where do... Um, 
Native Americans who are not living on their reservations or in their, their original homelands, where do they live, you know, and where do immigrants live and where do, you know, right, just the dynamics of that and the history of that in terms of how subdivisions were created and, and you know, the inequality that that promotes, where are, what are the schools looking like and what are the parks looking like and are there even any parks, you know. Um, so there are ways to do that in ways that I think are very relevant to students, mm -hmm. to young people, yeah. you know, and, and get at those things. That, of course, is a very big question. I guess what I would say that what a lot of that has in common, a lot of people who are calling themselves critical or calling their work critical or hoping to engage in critical movements, that there are a couple of things. One is that there is a... Uh, recognition of con contemporary problems and how far we still have to go, right? As opposed to a kind of like, oh, we've, you know, we've overcome and, you know, we've, we've solved all these problems and now we should be colorblind or blind to race, right? You know, there's, there's that recognition. No, there's still a lot to be done, right? And and that's, that's different from the mainstream approach, right? So which celebrates all of our, you know, accomplishments and our equality and, and so forth. And then the other thing is, is change, right? And um, how radical, how radical, I think that at least for some segment of those people who would call themselves critical race scholars, critical scholars in general, that they see a more radical port, path forward. Um, and that's an interesting conversation happening now, even in as kind of tame an area as electoral politics, right? Because you really see the difference between those people who are much more progressive and those in the Democratic Party and those people who are, are really saying, no, we need to be mainstream to, to attract these independent voters, right? So, so that's not you know, that's not quite exactly what's going on, but I think that there's a continuum there. Um, I would say, you know, I would like to encourage there to be more dialogue between critical race studies and education and critical race theory and law. You know, I think that there's, like, I know that there's some, some connections, but I think we need to have more um, connections. So maybe that is a uh, worth thinking about. How do we increase that dialogue and that kind of cross-pollination?